Um, I thought what I'd do first, other than talk about the spoons, is kind of give you just a general background. I don't know the background of all of you joining, but I thought what I'd do is give you just a general background as far as how spoons are made. So I'll show you um, some of the tools used in making spoons, and then we'll go from there. So generally, spoons um, either come from a piece of real straight grained wood, or uh, I don't know if you can see this, this is a bent branch, and a spoon generally would come from right here. This is a spoon that would come from this part of the branch. So that's one way to make a spoon. Um, and the tools generally used in making a, a spoon are uh, an ax, or this is a small hatchet, so you get the idea. Uh, a knife, a carving knife of some sort. Something like that. And uh, very commonly a spoon knife, which is basically like a straight knife that's been bent into the shape of a question mark. Uh, you also see uh, gouges used as well. So those are the standard tools for making spoons. Uh, my interest in spoons, as Josh said, was is lifelong. And uh, my, uh, I, my come to it from a fairly interesting, I think, point of view is that I grew up with lots of different spoons around me. We had a break front at home that was full of spoons of different types, both horn and bone and silver and, um, and in the kitchen. And I just thought I'd show you one that was always present in the kitchen. This is a well-worn spoon. It belonged to my great grandmother. And you can see in this spoon, the same things that happens with modern spoons today that we're making with pre-worn edges so that they fit the bowl. Um, that, so I think uh, with that, I'll, I'll, let's go to the, to the slides, Josh. Um, and I'll just do a little bit of introduction here. And I think, I think what's really interesting about spoons is one, they're very intimate. Um, you know, you put them in your mouth and it's a very shared experience that we all you do with people and um, every day with ourselves. And uh, we all come from a culture of wooden uh, use um, way back when. We can all trace our history back to that. And um, so it's, it's that kind of connection to wooden spoons that I really like, uh, that's common to all of us. And as far as the history of, of spoons, um, I think you, what you, what's, I find really interesting anyway is the, that first you have people eating with knives uh, and maybe if you know anything about the history of the word spoon, it means chip. It comes from the Old Norse. And Harley Refsall told me a story about it. Um, somebody probably picking up a chip off of the floor and using it to eat their porridge. And that maybe is the origin of a spoon, probably. Uh, the fork shows up the latest in the, uh, at the table. Um, in the 17th, late 17th century and early 18th centuries. So I put up two contemporary spoons. One is the top one is by Yoga Sundquist, and it's in birch. It's about a foot long. The other below it is by his father, Ville Sundquist. Um, and it's very, uh, it's not painted, obviously. Um, Yoga is very interested in the folk traditions, as was Ville. Um, but the one below is actually in some ways, some people describe it as being very similar to actually how Ville looked because he was very thin and wiry and the spoon kind of shows that. Ville and Yoge, um, along with several other people are really important in bringing spoons uh, to this country and starting the whole um, make it, making it yourself kind of movement in some ways, which um, Drew Langner is also a really important player in that because he brought Ville over here. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, I'm going to talk about three different types of spoons. Um, and this one is going to be, I'm going to talk about eating spoons primarily um, in this section. And uh, one of the things that you should note is that Early eating spoons had very large bowls. And I don't know if you can see this, 
Uh, this is a fairly large bowl. I wouldn't dare put this in my mouth without doing some real stretching. And they have fairly short handles. Um, and this is a Swedish one. Uh, but that was very common use of a spoon because that's one of the few things that people had that was their own uh, when they were uh, in rural Norway. And these traditions of communal eating continued well into the 50s after the war in some of these isolated farms up in the fjords of Norway and in other isolated parts of the country um, where all a lot of traditions might otherwise have been lost, like uh, using sighs to collect uh, hay, cut hay and things like that. So let's go on to the eating spoons. The next slide here. So, so this is a this is a really nice uh, flamed birch spoon. I think it's about six inches long, and um, I particularly like these. It's a little bit of a banana shaped spoon, so it's not something I would teach today how to do, but uh, it was very common uh, eating spoon with a large bowl, and you can see the. Um, the handle there has this nice little finger grip, flat palm uh, holder there. And we'll go down to the next one and you can look at the back and see how beautiful the wood is there. Um, and also I think um, you see how sh that short handle is typical of the period. These are medieval st style spoons, but obviously this one dates to 1846. So the pattern continued quite late into the 19th century. Let's go to the next one. So here's a detail of the of the tip of the handle on the top. And something uh, that's really stands out on this is the really deep bowl carving. Um, and also what I, you can't see really well when you're actually looking at the spoon is that that carving has all been cross hatched, even though this is flamed birch. Um, this cross hatching actually adds another dimension to the uh, carving on the handle. So that's um, quite something. You see that on furniture with stippling and things like that. And this is an attempt to give it a different look. Let's go to the next one. And that, that cross hatching, you can see here on the end of the underside of the handle, even in these little um, leaf pattern, stylized leaves there. And uh, you can see how there are little overcuts from the cross hatching, which I really like. Uh, and then you can see how deep and bold all the incising is on that rope twist. All right, let's go to the next one. This is um, a spoon in birch probably. And this is um, a fig shaped uh, bowl. Uh, which is typical. And if you see, uh, if you know Russian painted spoons, or you, you, they often have this shape. But this shape of spoon is dates back somewhat to the uh, 17th century. And you see these in silver and in pewter in this same form with short rope twist handles or wire twisted handles in the case of metal and, and the crown on the top. And some of them also have um, little uh, hanging bangles on the top. Um, and even the Sami uh, do similar type spoons like this in silver. Gene Tolkheim is known for his spoons that are similar to this. this these two um, images here actually reminded me this morning, and I didn't bring this up uh, or think about this before. And that was when I was in England, I went to Sheffield and there's a museum there that has metalwork and they had a history of spoons, believe it or not, um, in metalwork, in silver and pewter. And there were a whole bunch of examples like this uh, in, in silver or pewter. So it's kind of a chicken or egg thing. I wonder, you know, which one came first. But the, uh, the markings on these are very interesting, too. The, um, particularly that one you just push, went around on there. Those protection symbols show up in all kinds of objects and buildings. Um, in Norwegian culture and in, and in other cultures as well. So, uh, and the back, uh, if you look at the other side, I have no idea what that means, but it's, it's kind of interesting, the, uh, the back of the bowl and the inscriptions there. It's almost like a child's doodling. I'm not sure. Let's go to the next one. Uh, the only thing I'd say about that other spoon is that it's probably got a deeper bowl. In fact, I know it does 
So it's more of a broth spoon, something you might use for sipping broth out of. Okay, now you can go. This is another example of a kind of a banana medieval shaped spoon with a short handle that continued into the 19th century. Again, it's probably in flamed birch. It could be um, alder or even willow, um, but it's probably birch. Uh, but this one has, instead of um, the deep incision, uh, like the first one we saw, it's got this sort of chip carving and then this stylized around the, around the edge, but the same kind of a little shield motif at the top. And then this um, interesting kind of almost curbits like pattern or the kind of um, plant-like stylized design that you see on Kohlroth spoons uh, later on. So, and this one is a little more of a, I would call it a turnip shaped bowl or uh, I, I know people get all weird about that, but there's kind of different ways to characterize different bowl shapes. And I think this is more turnip shaped rather than a fig shape, but very well used too, if you'd seen it in person, so, which I have. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about tourist spoons and Tourist spoons are, I don't know if they're, if that's a general term that people use all the time, but it's one that I like to use. Um, it might be a little bit of a misnomer, but I think it kind of characterizes the, the general um, category of those spoons. And I talk about them as tourist spoons because lots of things came into play when these types of spoons um, developed. It's not that they weren't as a form there before, but they seem to have become more popular the closer we get to 1900 and going through the Industrial Revolution and people migrating off the farms to the cities and the rise of the automobile. And if you have seen the 1923 film of, I think it's a Swedish fellow carving a spoon very quickly, it's this type of spoon that um, becomes very popular at the time. Um, this is... Uh, I think it's an older version. Jennifer, I don't have the information on this spoon, actually. I did before, but I can't find it. That's okay. This one actually comes from, eight, uh, it's dated 1852. So 1852, yeah. okay. Um, this is a, a really beautifully done spoon. And it's, um, it's probably in birch, but it, again, it could be in alder, um, which is, sim is in the same family. And the hens on the, um, and the chicks on the bowl of the spoon are a common theme as are roosters and peacocks and things like that. You also see um, very stylized plant motifs um, that, similar to what you'd find in painted cabinets. Um, and then you see these often intricate diaper patterns around the edges of the bowl uh, and those show up in various forms uh, all on all lots of these kinds of spoons. I think the um, what's interesting to note are the are the scrolls at the top of the of the spoon that make it look sort of like a cabinet or a grandfather clock. Um, the other thing is that roosters, I would mentioned uh, chickens, feature in particular on these types of spoons, uh, as well as portraiture of um, kings, queens, and princes, and just um, sometimes ships as well. So, but not too many buildings. Uh, so let's go to the next one. And there's the back and you can see they carried that, uh, put the initials on the back and then carry those scroll motifs on the top of that shield type or crest, um, scroll crested handle. Let's go to the next one. So as far as tourists, type spoons, even though that one's not maybe in the category with being from 1856, is that right? Close, Jennifer? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Um, it's similar to these spoons, which might be later. Um, and here you can see uh, both of them, they have that kind of stylized plant motifs on the bowls and, uh, and on, the, on the handle. And then if we go to the details, which are the next slides, 
On the left, you'll see these are made fairly quickly. They're kind of a production spoon. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that people weren't making these at home and didn't have files, but these striations on the left, these angled striations indicate to me um, that that was made done with file. And then on the right, and you'll see this in that 1923 movie of that Swedish spoon maker, which is available on YouTube, by the way, and was at the community, um, carving a community um, uh, exhibit at Vesterheim. The bowls and the spoons get scraped with, the, with a knife. And you can see very clearly, at least I can with this, uh, these long uh, from the spine or the back of the bowl to the front of the bowl, um, these scrape marks, they're kind of light lines. And that's from scraping it with probably a knife. So I think those are things to look at when you're out hunting around at antique stores and things like that. Let's go to the next one. And then I didn't want to just leave you with the impression that all coal roasting, which I didn't talk about, but uh, I will a little bit. Coal roasting is kind of naive and a little unschooled because Here's an example of a, I believe this is a, a, a birch spoon that's probably about what, 12 inches long, something like that. Um, and it's got pretty florid, very tight and very schooled acanthus uh, coal roasting on it. And you can trace um, the lines back to the root of where the sea scroll starts, both on the handle and on the bowl. And then here again, it's got this kind of little diaper pattern around the edge of the bowl. And then, um, but this is also um, a, a very finely done um, coal roast spoon. And coal roasting is basically like engraving in wood. And it's uh, using a short little blade. And a lot of this coal roasting that was done on some of these spoons was done with the regular just carving knife. And this spoon, um, even though it's bigger, still has that tourist um, quality to it. This finial on the top, you'll see this uh, with, looks like a stylized tree almost. You'll see this in a whole host of spoons that come from diff very different regions in, the, in Norway. And um, you can, I'm, I'm sure that at some point somebody can trace all these back, at least I hope so, by the way the spoons look. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide here. So this is a, I chose these because out of the 146 images I had to look through, um, I chose these because it shows just the great care and the repair of the spoon. And you see repairs like this in lots of things in Vesterheim's collections, as well as others, the wire and the brass, little brass nails and glue on this really well used, what I would call a tourist spoon, but maybe not. Um, but it's a beautiful repair. And I just think it speaks to the, to how much this spoon was used and loved. And that's, I think that's pretty important to recognize. Just like with the Kingas or the elbows that have these wonderful repairs as well. So let's go to the next slide. So this is a, a serving spoons. Also, um, I'm thinking about spoons that were used for like stirring the laundry or making cheese or um, who, a whole host of things that would have happened on the farm that required large um, spoons. But serving spoons primarily are the ones, you know, for using at the table, but also for doing some farm or home chores. So that's the next category. And as I mentioned, some of these spoons were early on were made from branches and some of them were fairly straight grain and you'll get a really good chance to see in this category just exactly what that's like. Um, so this is a, a really interesting, it's an asymmetrical spoon, um, which is hard for me to do as a spoon carver. I like symmetry, um, but this one's made out of a burl and this is from, is it South Dakota, Jennifer, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I always want to say North Dakota, but um, South Dakota. And it was made by a fellow, um, I don't remember the dates, but it's from a burl. So he's hollowed out the burl and um, the bur it's been used. 
and then this very whimsical, it's fairly long spoon. I don't know what the wood is. Do you know, Jennifer? Does it, I, I don't know if it says. It, it doesn't happen to say in our, our records what it, okay. what it is. Okay, that's all right. It's a, but um, let's go to the next one. And here you can see the back of the spoon. And I, I'm re I really like the whimsical boot hook. Um, and I'm really glad it didn't break off. But it's, it's a beautiful little boot that you see on there. And then the back of the bowl has obviously um, been done with an ax or a hatchet. And you can see the really big chop marks in it. And I think it's great that they're still left there. You, we're so used to seeing things without the tool marks these days, on even on the underside of furniture. So this is a wonderful piece. And I love the, the really bold uh, scallop um, and diamond patterned handle. It's really a fabulous piece. So you get to see the whole thing as it kind of came out of the tree. This is a piece that I think dates pretty early. Um, and I, if I remember right, Jennifer, it's a... Yeah, the, the date on this one is 1829. 1829. So, and this was used for making bread dough. And I often say in my classes that um, I think spoons are very sexy. And even though this one's rather big, I think this is something like 17 inches long or something like that. Um, it's a really finely done, great spoon. And it's, it's just, I think it's really attractive. And I love the lines, the way the light comes off of it and the thin bowl and that wonderful hook to keep it from sliding into the, into the dough bowl. So, and I, this is probably birch as well. At least it looks like it to me. And I remember examining this one too, so I, I'm pretty sure it's birch. So let's go to the next one. This is another really beautiful spoon. Um, this is what I strive for in my work. Um, these wonderful facets. I'm not big on decoration, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. And this one is the form and the wood choice provides the decoration enough for me. I'd probably been a shaker in a former life. Um, this is a, a fairly large spoon. I think it's a little over a foot long. And it's a donation from Augsburg College to Westerheim. And it says Sister Bertha on the in Norwegian on the handle. And it's made out of a root burl. And you can see some of the little bark inclusions on from the root burl. And these little striations around the edge of the bowl are um, very typical of a birch root burl. And then we'll look at the side profile. And that kind of makes me swoon. Um, this is a great, uh, great piece. And you can see now the, the, the uh, curly burl wood in the bowl. And then you can see these continuous facets and this wonderful hook um, that surprisingly did not get broken off. But that shows how strong the wood is and the care taken to make it and how comfortable it could be for holding on. You can see it's like a holding on to a, a trigger almost if you to keep it from sliding into the bowl and in, out of your hand. So that's that's one of my favorite spoons actually in the collection. Let's go to the next one. This this by comparison is not maybe as uh, complicated or as sinewy as the other one, but it's still a wonderful spoon. And this one is made from a branch. And if you look at the bowl of it, you can see the curvature of the, or the diameter roughly of how big the branch might have been by looking at these, um, those little brown ray flex will give you a sense uh, around the front of the bowl of how big the branch was. This is, um, according to the papers, Mary Nelson picked this one up um, and it's got Sami decoration. And you can see that in there with the um, back to back diamond cuts in there and the very simple incised line decoration. And the white, uh, the very whiteness of this makes me think that it was probably used for making things like yogurt and or vili, which is a, a type of real stringy yogurt. Um, and it's uh, got a really straight handle. 
but the um, it's not oxidized like you get, uh, you'll see in the next slide, um, an oxidized, um, not this one, but there's the back of it. And you can see on the handle, there's a big, um, I think it's a branch inclusion there uh, that's broken off, but even so, it's still used. Um, and then even the back of the handle has these uh, nicely done little back-to-back um, -back diamond cuts. So it's very spare, but I, I just love it. Let's go to the next one. So in contrast to the previous slide, here you've got one that probably was used in something, um, and it's very similar to the, the one from Augsburg College donation. Um, it's got these brown stains on mostly on the inside and on the end grain where you get cooking fats and oils and possibly things like whey from making cheese when you heat it up uh, and you get these oxidations from just heavy, heavy food use um, with lots of oils and fats. And then this wonderful hook uh, that's similar to the one that was on the Augsburg spoon, but um, fairly short grain, but it still hasn't broken off. But the handle, uh, edge of the end of the handle did break off. So it must have been probably another couple inches longer. So this is a really great big ladle made out of really straight grained wood, but they've compensated for the, for the um, short grain in places by adding a little thickness through the neck and in buttressing up the back of the handle on that hook. So yeah, and if you go to the next one, Josh, that one, um, what's interesting here too, is you can see that they probably either scraped or used a file right along the back there. You see those myriad little lines there. So they may have used a file in shaping this as well. So that's a, that's a great heavily used one. This spoon is by Eric Teigen and Eric Teigen is, there are very few, I, I'd say there are very few um, named or known spoon carvers. And luckily, uh, Besterheim has quite a few of this fellow's spoons. And this one I picked because it's a real kind of tour de force. It's a political statement spoon and it's all coal roast. It's a very large spoon. I think it's 17 or 18 inches long and it's quite large. Um, and here you've got um, in 1896, which is what when this spoon dates to roughly, um, the country was going through a slight panic because because there, we were in a gold standard. And you see the little uh, flask on the table there that says gold cure. Um, and Uncle Sam is passed out or not looking too well. And that's because the gold reserves were slated to run out because there was a run on the banks. And James Pierpoint Morgan was brought in by Grover Cleveland to shore up the banks and uh, if you see the back of this bowl, um, oh, actually, you can see it in both of them. There's, there's a little sign right below the bottle on the table that says syndicate. And that was um, a syndicate that Pierpoint Morgan put together. And he profited from shoring up the banks, as did a number of other people. And people thought Grover Cleveland was going to do that, was also profiting. So he was disliked just as much um, as before, even though he was trying to do the right thing. Um, let's go to the back of the bowl. And there's a nice little front portrait uh, on the lower right there of Grover Cleveland and all the statistics here about how much it's gonna cost. And this really affected the common man uh, and woman out in rural areas. And in, in a lot of ways, um, it's very similar to what's been going on now. People felt the same way. There was a big populist movement um, in the country and it really, in a lot of ways, hasn't changed uh, at all. And so I thought this was a great um, way to kind of end and talk about how the past repeats in our current day. So we have, of course, we don't have a gold standard. We now have a Federal Reserve Bank, but that's because of what happened back in 1896. So those are some of the spoons I picked out and I hope you enjoyed it.